right, this looks like a respectable group. Uh, welcome everyone to the Finos Open Source Readiness Working Group. Uh, we're glad to have you all here today. Um, I'm thrilled to have uh, a, a guest speaker on a topic that we haven't done a lot uh, of sessions on in the past, which is uh, the interaction of open source and patents, uh, which I know is is uh, an, a question that's um, that's certainly on a lot of your lawyers' minds, if not your own. Um, and uh, Van has as much experience as anyone I know um, on this topic, so I'm really happy to have Van Lindbergh. Uh, Van is a partner at the law firm Taylor English, and he's also working on a new venture um, to support open source program offices that I will let him go into uh, himself. So Van, we're really glad to have you. Take it away. Well, thank you very much, Aaron, and I am glad to be here today. Uh, I'm going to share. I'm going to share my screen so that I can go through some slides. But I, uh, I do hope that if you have any questions, if you want to uh, raise your hand, put them in the chat, uh, or even, or even just speak up. I'm fully willing to make this a conversation because I think that this is one of the, those topics that is both very interesting and also can be somewhat complex. So. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to share just a second. All right. So you should be seeing, you should be seeing my, my screen now. If not, it'll probably come up in just a moment. So let me tell you uh, all just a, a little bit about me and, and, and where I came from. I started out as a, uh, a developer and I never really gave it up even when I went to law school. And so as soon as I came out, I started focusing on, on open source and uh, open source and helping companies with that. But I also found that there with some, for someone with an engineering degree, the, the, most, val the most commonly re requested service was actually related to patents. And so my entire career has been sort of balancing these two things, uh, both both uh, patents and how to deal with and manage patent assertions, and then also open source. And so, a lot of the questions that I always get are, how are we going? How can you manage these two things at the same time? So, a lot of this, to a certain extent, this came to a head somewhat last year. I don't know how many of you know who David Kapos is. He's a he's a partner at uh, at Cravath, um, and also the former undersecretary for the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And he wrote an article in the uh, uh, he wrote an article in the Columbia Science and Technology Law Journal, arguing that open source licenses were inherently that at least most of them were inherently compatible with uh, royalty bearing patent licenses. Uh, I uh, thought that this was incorrect. And so we uh, I, I reached out and they gave me the opportunity to actually publish a, a response piece in the in the same in the same journal uh, uh, next to uh, Kapos's piece. And this caught a lot of people's eyes because while I believe that I had the the significantly the better of the argument, if a lot of people didn't read a lot past the, the 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 headlines, and all they saw was here are people arguing as to whether open source and patent protection is compatible, uh, and especially because in particular where we were looking at this idea of paying royalties. Uh, him saying, hey, these are compatible, and, and I was saying, no, they're not, really led to a few people having some, having some confusion. So that's part of what I'd like to go into today, is understand how these things can work together. And in fact, most open source oriented companies are major patent holding companies. Uh, for example, the largest patent holding company in the world, IBM, uh, bought Red Hat, which is also is, which is the largest uh, which is the largest open source oriented company in the world. Now, I know I didn't say open source using or, or or open source companies because one of the things that 
I am sure you are coming to grips with is the fact that every company uh, has, uh, essentially every company has open source in it. And usually they have a significant amount of open source in it, more than people frequently realize. Um, but the fact is that even for companies who have defined their business models in a significant way around open source, uh, Google has done a lot of uh, Google has done a lot of this. Uh, Microsoft is now doing a lot of this. Uh, GitHub uh, GitHub uh, uh, is now part of Microsoft. There, all of them have a all Novell. If you if you remember them, um, all of them have very significant patent holdings. So obviously, it can be done in a way that these are compatible. The real question is, how do you do it? So the key thing, the key takeaway for at least this part of the presentation that I want you to understand is that open source licensing is not at all a bar to patent protection. Um, but you want to, you should realize that if you distribute some code under an open source license to a person, and that code implements a patented invention, then you are also giving a license for that person to practice that patented invention, at least in the context of that code. Now, how much farther that can go, how much farther that goes, uh, gets into some of the specifics of the licenses and can be a little bit complicated. But you have to understand that you can have patents and you can have them apply around or to different parts but that specific that specific grant if you hand someone open source code and it implements the patent you are you are giving them a license to at least the claims implemented by the code that you that you wrote uh, so you do have to understand that that is an essential part of of what make op makes open source work is the grant of grant of rights so that people have the they call it the the ability or the freedom to uh, to make sure that they can they can build on that code etc and that is something that needs to happen need means that you need to grant them the patent the the patent rights but you don't always need to grant all the patent rights in all the times. So I wanted to focus, look at this in terms of three primary questions. Uh, they're here on the screen. What is the business purpose for the patent protection? What is the scope of the open source license? And how can open source and patents be used cooperatively as part of an overall patent portfolio? So when I've looked at it, I found that Patents are, patents are usually used for one of these five purposes. Uh, the first is this idea of insurance. Anytime someone says, we have a defensive patent portfolio, what they are doing is they're essentially invoking the insurance focus, the, the, the insurance model of, of patents. What they mean is, we don't necessarily want to assert these things, but we want to have some sort of leverage in case of someone else tries to assert against us. Um, a lot of times this is going to be used so that there is a cross license, uh, a, especially a no charge cross license, as opposed to getting uh, involved in a patent lawsuit or needing to pay a substantial royalty or a, or a large judgment. A second focus is what I call the investment focus, the investment model. That says whether or not you're looking at you're trying to invest in your people by developing their capabilities, rewarding uh, innovation, uh, developing an R&D culture, or you're also looking at inter external finance and saying and wanting to show a patent portfolio as part of an overall set of assets that promote a certain value for your company. That's, that's really the investment uh, focus of, of a patent portfolio. The third is an assertion, uh, a, a assertion. Now this means that sometimes you want to have 
sometimes you feel like you are a, you're a big company. Sometimes you need to go up against your competitor. And in the case where you are in a lawsuit, you would like to be able to at least credibly threaten or assert a patent in the scope of a larger, bi a larger business conflict between you and, and another company. Note that this is not necessarily about extracting something from them. This is about actually achieving some sort of larger business objective. Uh, the third, the fourth is protection, uh, being able to prevent others from using your proprietary technologies. Uh, this is the sort of the classic model. A lot of way when people are taught about the patent system, they're taught that this is the the true purpose. But it ends up being actually one of the less followed reasons for creating for creating and using a patent portfolio. And then fifth is to is in association with the, it's not the same as assertion because assertion is about uh, having a tool in the case of a larger business conflict where revenue may involve patent assertion, but is really about leveraging the patents themselves as a monetizable asset to create uh, a new revenue stream. So are these things compatible with open source? Some. Uh, the insurance, uh, you, you can see here, the insurance investment and assertion models are actually quite compatible with, uh, with even a majority open source. Protection and revenue, not so much, um, but it can be mitigated. Uh, why is that? The big reason is that is what is the focus, if the focus of what you're doing is really associated with others and what they and and their uh, and their valuation as opposed to the patent instrument itself, uh, then you it can it can be used in a very compatible manner. For example, in in terms of insurance, the most effective patents um, for and it, both insurance and assertion are not the ones that read on or implicate your own products. They're the ones that read on or implicate things that your competitors or the potential asserters will, are, are, are doing. Because it doesn't matter if you are doing something, if you have a patent on something that only you are doing, yes, that matters to a certain extent from a protection point of view, but the only real power pro provided by a patent is the ability to prevent someone else from doing something. And in the context of a business dispute, the power actually comes from preventing your competitor from doing something, which means that the best patent portfolio is not the one that is inwardly directed, but the one that is outwardly directed uh, and is, is focused in terms of claims and even, uh, e even the the type of, of things that you investigate and file patents on based upon what you think your competitors are doing as well and where you would like to have sufficient freedom to operate in the future. Uh, one, of the company, one of the companies that I worked with uh, has, an interesting, uh, has an interesting focus where they actually create a competitor score where they look at how much is this competitor in our space or do we expect them to be in our space? How many patents do they have? How assertive are they? And they put sort of, they put, they, they figure out sort of a score for each one of these things. Uh, and then they try and what they try to do is they try and balance the amount of their competitors' products that they could assert against versus the amount of their own products that the competitor could assert against. And they look at that as a ratio and they try and keep that ratio essentially at one, uh, uh, at one to one, uh, so that if, the, if their competitor starts to get stronger, uh, stronger in that way, well, they build up a little bit in that area, but that also keeps them from over-investing in a particular place because really all they want is essentially a, a, a license for freedom to operate. Um, 
I, I mentioned that a lot of these are also other directed uh, investment, even though it is also directed at sort of the, the financial overall portfolio value. There's also that internal you want to develop your people. But note that, again, that that's not focused on the patent instrument. That's focused essentially on getting value in terms of the, the people as opposed to the patent itself. Looking at protection and revenue, first is if you are, if what you're trying to do is you're trying to prevent people from using your proprietary technologies, then you sh probably should not be open sourcing those proprietary technologies. Um, it's just the name of the, it's just the name of the game. Open source is not easily compatible with keeping secrets. Uh, and so the best way to, if you want to have proprietary technologies, uh, including ones that are patented, the easiest thing to, way to manage that and mitigate that is by not having that be a portion of your portfolio that you open source. Uh, similarly, and this gets back to those earlier uh, papers between Capos <clears throat> and myself, uh, revenue, it, trying to develop a revenue source uh, out of the patent instrument itself, you can do that, again, just as long as it is not also the subject of the open source license, because the open source licenses require a royalty-free license. So let's say that you are really focused on, on some of these things, and you want to have some sense of protection or revenue. You want to look at that, that mitigation. What do you need to do? First thing, that uh, this sort of moves on to that second question, how broad is the patent grant? And this gets a little bit into the evaluation of the, the, the scope of the license itself and weirdly the scope of copyright. Um, so the first thing that you need to look at is there are both explicit uh, explicit and implicit patent grants, um, or ex sometimes I call them express patent grants, even if it doesn't have the, the, uh, the patent grant language. Let me explain what that means for a second. Uh, every, every single uh, open source license has some patent related language in it. If you look at the patent statute in the United States, there are really essentially a few verbs that are protected. What are the essential uh, things to do? Make, use, sell, offer to sell, uh, uh, and, uh, and import, export. Uh, in this case, usually it is uh, use, but sometimes there's also sell. Sometimes there's also types of making. Um, and so, when they use when a license uses the the patent verbs and says you can do these patent verby things but doesn't actually say and you have a patent grant i call that an express license as opposed to an explicit license because they are giving you express permission to do patent related things they're just not saying the word patent uh, for those where you have an express patent grant um, so, uh, an express patent grant that says the words, we grant you a patent license to do X, Y, Z. There are different scopes associated with those. And I, I have some language from the GPL3 and the Apache 2. Um, the main difference in scope that you really need to look at and you really need to analyze is, does this, does this patent, uh, is the patent grant scoped to the contribution that I'm giving or to the project that I'm giving it to. Um, and that is a little bit, uh, that, that's a little bit different. One, uh, and that can vary essentially between the, between the licenses. The other thing that you really need to understand is where does the license stop? Because let's say that there, whether it's express or uh, explicit, the there is an end to the patent grant. 
and that the end of the patent grant is not only defined by the terms of the patent license, but it's also determined by the scope of the copyright license, because the patent license that is granted through the open source uh, through the open source license is not going to go farther than the open source license. So you need to look at what are the the typical borders of copyright protection. And while it's not un necessarily universally true, a good shorthand way to usually think about it is: is there a process or network barrier between uh, between these two pieces? And if so, there's a good chance that there is going to be essentially a bound, copyright boundary, which will also serve to be a patent license boundary as well. And so if you do careful analysis and careful, arch, uh, uh, careful architecture in terms of how you have these different pieces that work together, it is possible to have interrelated pieces with different licensing, including having some pieces that are, uh, that are patented, and proprietary and some pieces that are open source. Um, what about, and if you have an integrated strategy though, what does that mean? And I think that part of what you need to look at is I, I talk about the 80-20 rule of business value. So if you think of this as the total value that your company brings to the customer, there is, uh, there is a portion of it, in fact, the majority of it, that is necessary functionality, but is not really the reason why your customer is buying. Uh, an example that I sometimes use is the dialer on your phone. It doesn't matter whether you use an iPhone or an Android or something else. Uh, being able to dial a phone number is necessary functionality. If you didn't have that functionality, it would be a really terrible phone and you wouldn't actually want to buy it. It would detract from sales. It is necessary to, to the device. But no one really buys any particular phone because they have an awesome dialer. Uh, it ends up being, it, it ends up going, you know, washing away. And in in, instead you're looking at, what is the integration? What is the app compatibility? What is the design? What is the form and function? What are all these other things that are actually reasons to buy? So if you think about it, there is a differentiating portion. That's the reasons why people buy. And there's a supporting portion, which is required for functionality, but is not the reason why people buy. And if you think about it, everything below this line can be uh, essentially open source because by definition, it is not the reason why people buy. And so it, you can actually use an open source cooperative strategy to reduce your costs and your, and your time to market. Whereas this differentiating portion up at the top, you, that's one of the places where you want to look at some of the more protective types of IP strategies, such as patents, such as trade secrets. Um, so, when people really get into open source, what are the reasons why they do so? And if you look at the difference, differences here versus the differences why people get into their uh, the patent portfolio, it's very interesting that the, they are completely different. Developing a platform for innovation, returning, reducing long-term risk, gaining mind share, market share, recruiting, retaining, and developing people and reducing the cost of product and ser service delivery. There's almost, other than this idea of recruit, retain, and develop, uh, developing people, there's actually almost no overlap between the purposes that why a company gets into open source development versus the reasons why they develop a patent portfolio. So that, that shows you that the, you, these are actually different and complementary tools for addressing different parts of your IP toolbox. Fact is, not all intellectual property is of equal value. And sometimes lawyers, uh, and all uh, lawyers, tend to focus on the crown jewel pieces, crown, crown jewels of the IP portfolio. And they create policies that are focused mostly on licensing these very rare, very high value pieces of IP. And the fact is that most IP that you've got 
is actually of the supporting variety. And sort of paradoxically, if what you do is create your IP strategy around the things that you don't license very often that you want to keep as close as possible, you actually can reduce the total amount of your IP portfolio that you license and thus reduce the overall value of your license and the overall value of your portfolio. Uh, holding it too close means that it doesn't get used quite as much, doesn't get licensed quite as much, and you don't get as much value out of it. One of the one of the strategies which I think is particularly interesting, uh, we did this while I was uh, a couple of years ago. I was uh, in house at Rackspace uh, for several years managing their uh, intellectual property. And one of the things that we did is we created a, we at that time were pushing very heavily into OpenStack. I don't know how many of you are are familiar with OpenStack. It's a cloud computing system uh, meant to be broadly compatible with slash competitive with uh, cloud offerings like AWS or Google Cloud. Uh, one of the things that we were afraid of were, were, were licensing requests from large operating companies. Uh, I won't name any ones in particular, but we had had situations in the past where we actually uh, where, where we actually had a large company that was one of our partners come and say, by the way, even though we know we're partners, we want you to start paying us a patent royalty. And we were able to put them off at that point. But this was something that really drove our, uh, our thinking around uh, both patents and, and open source. And so we, were, we leaned very much into this insurance, uh, uh, this insurance model of, pat, of patent portfolio building because we had already had an experience where some, an operating company wanted us to start licensing. So what we did is we actually used the, we released uh, we, we released this code under the Apache license. And one of the things about the Apache license, uh, but this can happen with others, with other licenses as well that have an explicit patent grant, is that uh, when you license it in, you essentially give other people a license for, for the things that you said, uh, for, for, for the things that you contribute. And the way in which we, uh, the way in which we, uh, put in the, the copyright license agreement to, to put code code in, uh, said, had it have sort of this project scope. So at the time, OpenStack was a, was a very substantial part of our overall business and was uh, one of the places where we had, we, we felt like we had the most exposure because it was growing, uh, growing quickly at that time. It was in a new area. There was a lot of patent activity around it. Um, but by bringing in, bringing in a bunch of our competitors in an open source context and with a li open source license that had a, an explicit patent grant, we were actually able to, uh, to get our competitors to give us enough of a patent grant for their licensable patents that gave us freedom to operate for this uh, for OpenStack, maybe not for other par portions of our uh, por of our business activities, but for this one that we were particularly concerned about, the fact that we used it, it essentially forms a patent pool uh, that is specific to one piece of code, and that that's the way that you can think about some of these open source uh, licenses is they create sort of a free trade zone in intellectual property, including from patents. Uh, and we were able to do that. And so that at a later time, at a later time, when companies would come to us, including some of these people and said, hey, what would you think about licensing our patents? We were able to respond, well, we already have a license sufficient for this big of our business. You've already given it to us. And this was something that went around some of the normal patent licensing models and was able to achieve the business purpose. Hey, Van, um, we've got a question in chat from uh, Junji Kato, who is at Itaú, uh, a Brazilian bank, about some international concerns. I'll go ahead and read the questions to you. Okay. Uh, 
What are some of the cross-border concerns? I work for a Brazilian bank, and patents is pretty much a not is pretty much non-existent for software. Presumably, he means in Brazil. Uh, and would it be a good practice, even for a Brazilian bank, to think about a patent strategy, even without necessarily filing for a patent? I think that it is important. I, th those are great questions. Um, those are great questions. Uh, I would say that you start out by, yes, absolutely, you should think about a patent strategy if you, even if you're not going to file, because you want to be intentional about whatever it is that you do. Um, uh, let's go back for a second. For, um, you, 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 you want to be intentional about whatever you do. With regard to, is this something that you should be focusing on in particular? I think that a lot of that is going to depend upon where your revenue is and where you, are, where you expect your growth to come from. Uh, for example, if, as you said, if you're in a Brazilian bank, uh, software patents are not necessarily a thing. I, I haven't looked. I'm, I think that you would probably include some of those, uh, those uh, like what we call business method patents as also not necessarily being very, uh, having a, a, a lot of uh, a foothold there. But just as an aside, beware when people say, oh, we have no software patents or we have no business method patents. It, a lot of times those sorts of that software or those business methods can be expressed in other ways that make them end up being patentable, including in places like Brazil or Europe or other places that broadly have tougher or different standards around software business processes. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't get an effective, same, a similar scope of, of protection. The way that I would look at it though, from your perspective is I would say, what is our risk associated with where our revenue is coming from? And if your revenue is coming from uh, all from Brazil and you think that the the risk from competitors in Brazil is is particularly low. This may not be something that you focus on. Uh, if what you're doing though is you say, "All right, at some point we're going to be expanding into a different market. We're going to be expanding into China or the United States or Europe or something like that," uh, then probably what you might like to what you should think start thinking about is. How can we get into a place where we are protected in that new market? And that goes actually back to um, the this uh, providing leverage or getting leverage against competitor licensing requests, either the insurance or insert or assertion models. If you think that that is going to happen in within two or three years, then uh, starting to think about that now. Uh, is a good plan because patents take a long time to mature uh, and it takes a little while and a lot of effort to, to develop a tool that, that meets your business purpose. Uh, Aaron, any other, before I move on, any other questions or Junji, uh, uh, does that answer your question? Uh, Chuji, I'm on you. Okay. He says, thank you. So I will take that as a signal that you did answer his question. Go, go ahead. Okay. So then I'd like to take a little bit of a look at the other side for a moment. Um, what is, let's say that part of what you're doing is you are, you've decided you're going to focus, your purpose is focusing on developing the open source side of your business. Then, but you know that you are actually in a patented space. How in the world do you protect yourself? How do you protect your freedom in the face of patented technologies? And that sort of came to a head with, with the uh, lawsuit last year by Rothschild Patent and Imaging against GNOME. Uh, that was really surprising for a lot of reasons. And the biggest reason 
uh, was that um, it it doesn't really end up making a lot of financial sense to go against a nonprofit that doesn't have any money and really had very little uh, uh, had didn't really have any uh, proprietary advantage. My take was actually they were being a little bit sloppy, honestly, and that this ended up actually getting resolved in favor of GNOME, but not only for for their exact things that they were doing, but also for uh, but also for all open source because I think they realized there's not a lot of money here, and so it doesn't it doesn't fit. But for all of you, or at least almost all of you. In the context of a, a an operating company where you do have revenues, you do have money, you are a target. So how do you uh, how do you if you are seeing open source as part of your uh, growth strategy, what do you do to protect yourself? Um, well, I'm going to assume a couple things here that uh, you want to avoid patent issues. Uh, you want to avoid patent lawsuits. And I'm also going to assume that if you are at least, uh, if you are trying to drive open source in your organization, that at least internally, you're looking, if you're, even if you're participating in the patent program, a lot of that is actually going to be on this insurance model. What you're trying to do is preserve freedom to operate not necessarily create a revenue stream or protect proprietary technologies. So what are the ways in which you, you can make this work? Uh, I'd like to say that this ends up being essentially a risk management problem, not actually a legal problem. Um, and so one of the things that you need that you can look at is, first of all, just where where do you invest? Uh, where do you invest? And there are particular places that are notorious minefields associated with, with patented technologies. Um, uh, uh, audio video codecs are one of these. Uh, places where you interact with hardware are another one. These are the places that tend to be most highly fraught uh, and most uh, and most heavily patented. Um, you're going to need to either have a strategy like VLC, where they are in a non in a country they distribute only from a country that doesn't recognize the applicable patents, which limits your scope. Or you're going to need to step very carefully in terms of how you uh, how you go into these areas. You may not want to try and go into uh, go into, uh, for example hardware development uh, without uh, just sort of blindly and unless you uh, unless you've thought very carefully about the patent issues the second thing is that there are some tools associated with open source that are not brought necessarily brought broadly available and one of those is the open invention network i don't know if any of you have heard that it is a patent pool for linux related technologies and what's one of the things that's interesting is that it they actually grow their scope about every year and you can think of it as covering most of the things in a typical linux distribution so not just the kernel almost everything in a typical linux distribution whether it be for the desktop or the server uh, so that means that and there are somewhere around three thousand different licensees including many substantial licensees which means that this is going to be a place where they, you have a known and growing group of both safe technologies to build on and, and companies that have non-assertion pledges. And at least broadly, OIN has said that they are interested in helping protect companies against patent assertions as well. So that's a good tool. The third is to have if you are accepting contributions from someone else that has a contribute and you have a contributor license agreement, make sure your contributor license agreement has a patent grant. Uh, a good example here is the standard Apache CLA, 
uh, it's the one I recommend. Note that the the standard DCO language, while it functions as a copyright license agreement, does not have any patent grant, and so I recommend against it for that reason, at least for any uh, possibly patent holding entities or people who are who are engaging with your project on that behalf. Uh, the next is I told you I talked about explicit versus express patent licenses. Uh, you're always better off if this is going to be a uh, worry with with a license that has an explicit explicit patent license. It just is going to make it less uh, troublesome to uh, troublesome to litigate if or negotiate about if you ever need to do so. Uh, this number five gets to this idea of, uh, of the patent pool, the de facto patent pool, like I described in the context of OpenStack. If you can get other patent holding entities to contribute to your same project, this essentially creates a protected patent pool, even without a lot of the revenue sharing and the back and forth and the legal negotiation, because you create this patent pool that's defined by the code instead of by an agreement. It ends up being an extremely powerful and capable mechanism for managing patent risk, uh, uh, managing patent risk, and one that a lot of people are using sort of not knowledgeably uh, because it's an inherent feature of these licenses. But if you if you think about it expressly as a tool, there are ways in which you can use it to to establish and develop your freedom to operate. Uh, the next one is stay away from money, or at least one way of doing it is separating the money from the IP ownership. There's a number of companies that have done this, um, where they have a IP holding company, and then they have the operating company, and those are separate. And sometimes what you can do is you, there are some ways in which if you are very careful, you can actually uh, you, you can actually make a grant to a third party and then have third parties make grants on your behalf so that you actually firewall off some of your patent portfolio or some of the patent portfolio issues from your open source issues. And that can also, like I said, keep the, uh, it, it, as soon as you make your, make it so that the, for example, the, if this open source stuff that you're participating in is, does not have a good connection to the, the revenue that you, your, comp, your organization generates, well, then that makes it a less attractive target. And then finally, for, if you are approached from a, by someone where there is a where they're suggesting that there's going to be a patent assertion needs to be taken very, very seriously. Um, it needs to be, maybe there's a workaround, maybe there's pulling out some code, uh, maybe remove it, uh, at least develop a non-infringement theory uh, and make it, and, and publish it and make it so that it is public. One of the value, one of the things that ends up actually being very, very powerful in the context of open source is that you're not doing things in secret. Uh, and so you actually have the ability to be loud uh, and, and to be aggressive in terms of how you respond to certain types of threats. If you think about the GNOME, uh, uh, GNOME lawsuit, they were able to get a lot of high level help very quickly and and far out of a far greater scope than they could do themselves simply because what they were doing is they were standing up for a larger com a community that was larger than themselves and that is that that's something that's pretty powerful and uh, something that you should take advantage of so I sometimes called that the rabid dog strategy, where you, if you, if you can convince the people that you're actually going to be uh, economically irrational in terms of the way in which you go at, respond to threats, they're going to be less likely to engage with you.
uh, and, and be aggressive towards you. So with that, um, that is sort of ha the, 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 a whirlwind tour of managing open source and patents, both from the side of, hey, we want to maintain a patent portfolio and we want to maintain an open source portfolio. And really it comes down to understanding what are your business objectives for each, how do they intersect, and then making sure that you use each strategy in the place where it most makes sense. Now we've got uh, a few minutes. I thought I'd throw it up from open for any questions or comments. It looks like we've got one more in the chat if you want to take a look there. Okay. I'm... I, I will read it while you find the chat. Um, this is from uh, Richard Wagner of CodeThink. In your experience, do you see features migrating um, from differentiating or proprietary to supporting or cooperative um, over time? And what factors play a role in the financial sec sector that help with this process? In addition, what barriers exist that prevent features from moving to a cooperative position? Referring to your 80-20 slide. Oh, that is a fantastic, that's a fantastic question. Um, so absolutely, I see that um, there are features that are, that migrate from differentiating, uh, differentiating to being simply cooperative, uh, simply supporting, and you all have seen it. Everyone has seen that when someone raises the bar, when they first come out with it, it's exciting and new and, and something, uh, something that no one else has. But as competitors try to match it or try to work around it or try to, to develop it, it becomes simply part of the overall, uh, the overall requirement from customers. So absolutely, this line is always moving. That's why, that's why the most effective organizations are ones that are always actually needing to move forward. And so you should be actively reevaluating regularly what are the things that are uh, that are right at the cusp between being differentiating and supporting. Uh, and and if you think through those and you see people uh, and, and you see it where it's starting to become common functionality, there are several plays that you can use in order to start. Uh, in order to enhance your co uh, competitive position. Let me be a little bit more concrete. Let's say that there was, uh, and you mentioned the financial sector. Um, let's say that there was a, uh, a particular type of uh, payment processing functionality that was app enabled, uh, that was app enabled and you or some other, you had some patents on, and you came out with it. It was you came out with it a few years ago, and it started to. It was a big hit, uh, but other competitors they took a look at your product, they took a look at your patent, and they started developing things that were similar in functionality, but worked their way around more or less successfully worked around your patent, and it started to be that this was something you saw becoming a common. Uh, a common piece of functionality, and at that point, when you look at looked at it from the look at it from the customer's perspective, they don't really care in some ways how the back end works with enough specificity to really care about the differences between different patented implementations. Uh, what they care about is the end result, which is usually far too abstract and too big to to have a a patent on. So at that point, you see, here's something that was differentiating and is moving down to supporting. So what is your play at that point? Uh, one of the things that you can do is you can actually try and drive the commoditization of that particular piece of functionality by consciously yourself moving it from differentiating into supporting by adopting an open source model, uh, a, a, an open source model. This is one of those places where you can use uh, open source and the fact that you have patents in a very strategic way. For example, if you were to clean up and, and push out your code or a derivative of your code, 
and it has those patents associated with it. And then encourage and try and get a lot of other people to use, uh, to develop this functionality as well. Note that, that no one else is going to have a license to your patents unless they are also using your code. The license it is not separate from the code. So that means that you would still have the ability to, you, first of all, you can drive the, the direction of the industry in a way that is that rewards your initial development and your initial innovation, reduces your, your cost while, while if you bring other people in, it lowers your ongoing cost, but it makes other people, if, if what you've done is drive something that's going to be a commodity, turns out that if they're going to hop on board this community train, they need to throw away their code and it, it actually increases the cost for your competitors, while at the same time lowers your ongoing cost. But note that if someone says, well, we want to continue to go our own way, great, we're going to accept that this is a community standard, this is great. Turns out that they only have a patent license if they use your code and if they play in the sandbox nicely with you. Um, if they choose to create a proprietary implementation and compete with your open source implementation that also has patented technologies associated with it, turns out that you can actually still assert your patents uh, against that proprietary implementation. And that actually has nothing to do with, and in fact, reinforces the attractiveness of the open source implementation that you standard, uh, that, that you shepherd. Uh, Richard, does that uh, make sense or any follow-up questions? Uh, Richard acknowledges in the chat that you have answered his question. Um, Jim Jagelski asks, from a patent perspective, is there any benefit um, from to hosting the open source project via foundation uh, versus on your own? Um, the difference is in terms of the scope of uh, the scope of what are the licensable patents. If the uh, if the licensable patents are you, if your organization owns patents, but the foundation doesn't, um, then, and, but it is foundation granting the license, then you may be able to, to change the scope of what is granted by, by putting it through a foundation. Now that's one reason to go through a foundation. Uh, sometimes foundations are a good idea. Sometimes they're not. Um, it all, kind of depends. Um, so don't take this as a, this is, but this is something definitely that you should think of. The other thing that you can do is that you want to think about who is the possible, uh, who's the possible assertion target and who's the uh, possible, possible assertion entity. Uh, if you have, if there are some patents, for example, if there are, if, if there are, if there is code that is provided to a to a foundation, then is the foundation going to be the patent asserting? And for some reason, a patent needs to be asserted. Is the foundation going to do it? Are they going to have standing? Uh, or is it going to need to be an individual? Um, so I think that the biggest reasons to use a foundation are not associated with patents. They're more about signaling to others a signaling to others that you are going to play according to uh, on an even playing field with with them um but i think that the uh biggest thing to think of is from a patent perspective is where are the where are the patents going to go and does this change the scope of what is licensable Great, thank you. Well, it looks like the hour is over or nearly over. Um, Van, I wanted to give you uh, an opportunity to talk quickly about uh, OSPOCO, um, your new uh, venture to support open source program offices, if you're, if you're interested in doing that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I get excited about all, all sorts of stuff. And so I perhaps spent uh, a little long. 
uh, on the, the patents and the open source. So one of the things that I'm doing, this is a this is in cooperation with uh, not only my law firm, but uh, but some others and a number of providers. We're setting up uh, essentially an open source program office as a service. Um, uh, so hence Ospoco. Uh, that is designed to either allow companies uh, to to develop their to to have a, have all the the services of a normal Ospo, including doing some of the analysis of of what is the business function associated with a particular code. Is this compatible, or does this implicate a uh, a patent license, uh, a, a patent license, or part of our patent portfolio? Uh, is this uh, how can we interact with various foundations, uh, doing code reviews, things like that, and to do it on an as a service basis uh, with with generally flat rate pricing, and some of the things that we're we're doing for we're doing for our clients is we are. Uh, both doing pull review requests. So let's a company wants to submit something. We uh, uh, we review the request and help shepherd it upstream. Uh, we a number of you may use something like Fossa or White Source or Black Duck or uh, or some other code scanning. That tend, ends up going to a human for a review. That's one of the things that we do is we try and get companies that have built that into their uh, continuous integration pipeline, uh, we get those reports and we review them. A lot of the idea is similar, very similar to this idea of a fractional CFO or fractional CMO, where companies may need a little bit of extra help and they may need a little bit, even if you've got an OSPO, a lot of times it, having been in, in house, I know some it's very difficult to get an additional head, but the work still needs to go on and is increasing. So what do you what can you do? This can be something that can either function as an OSPO or can expand the the scope and the capability of your OSPO by by bringing in a virtual team that that acts in conjunction with the people that you have. So that's uh that's at ospo.co and uh, maybe I'll have a chance to talk to that you some more, but I see that we're at, we actually hit the top of the hour. Great. Well, thank you so much um, both for a fascinating presentation, Van, and uh, and for that information. I'm going to go ahead and put the URL um, into chat. Oh, sorry, that was the wrong one. <laughs> my my fingers just automatically type a. Um, an M after Co. Um, you know, I think it's a really interesting uh, uh, option for for firms that are looking to build out their uh, their open source program office capacity, particularly in the short term, as they look to build um, the office uh, or their resources internally. Um, so I, you know, I I I don't know of anybody else doing that kind of work. So I think it's a really interesting. Um, a really interesting venture that I'm definitely going to keep an eye on myself. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined. Um, and I look forward to seeing uh, the rest of the group uh, in two weeks at our next meeting. Van, I'll see you around. Take care.